All right, thank you all. Uh, welcome back for another uh, series. This is our four-year talk series. We are in uh, week three, so this is our third session of four sessions. Uh, the theme is really based around, as we continue to say, learning best practices around tools of the trade, and also just uh, based on continuing to educate and inform and share and collaborate with our interior design community. Um, Today, we're going to start a little differently. Uh, we're going to put together, you know, a lot of folks always say, you know, how do you work on your business, not just in your business? So I've heard that a lot. So I'm going to share a few things that deal with more of the business side of things and less about um, the design side of things. So I'm going to share with you just kind of my five top, top reads uh, for business, because at, at the end of the day, even as interior designers, we still need to focus on growing a successful business. We need to, we need to pay attention to what's going on uh, for how we build our business, how we grow the business, not just, not just simply around the tools of the trade, uh, even though they're super important. So I put together what I consider my top five reads um, that, you know, were very meaningful to me in a lot of ways. Some of these I pull out year over year um, and others just every, every few years as a reference to go back to some of the notes, uh, some of the areas I've highlighted. So when we talked uh, previously, this is my absolute number one favorite book of all time. This is truly one that I pull out year over year over year. I've got several copies, some that are um, <laughs> dog-eared and have tons of writing and, and highlighting in them and another that is uh, a more formal that I, I didn't uh, scratch to do too much scratch uh, and notes with. But Think and Grow Rich was written back in 1937. And to, to me today, it's still as relevant as anything out there. Um, and it's all inspired by Andrew Carnegie, who I consider to be probably one of the best businessmen uh, of all time. And so this is a book that really talks about how to achieve not only wealth, but also how to do the things you love to do and achieve that type of wealth, right? How do we maximize our opportunities in the world to basically create, uh, you know, monetary value back to a lot of the goals that we have? So um, this is basically a book that uses the word desire over and over and over again. Um, and the term desire is really a strong feeling of wanting something to happen. So I highly suggest that you get a copy of this book, mark it up, read it. Uh, it's something you could pull out on a regular basis. There's so many tricks to the trade inside this book. Um, and I think it will help a lot of uh, the designers work on their business and not just in the business. Another book, uh, and I talked about this over the, the longer two-day talk, which is The Pursuit of Happiness. I had the opportunity to meet Chris Gardner uh, about 10 years ago at an event and listen to him speak. And the amount of adversity that this man dealt with, both in his personal life growing up and then as his adult life, to get himself back on track um, after being abandoned by his father, um, and then to raise his child and be so committed to not only his kid, but just to pursue his dream of making, you know, his life better, uh, his child's life better, going from homeless living on the streets to just being a successful stockbroker to eventually owning his multi-million dollar brokerage firm is just amazing. And it shows that if you put your mind to it, uh, and if you work hard to accomplish the things you want to do and you stay laser focused in that lane, um, you can really build your business to, to amazing heights. So another uh, book that I would highly recommend people look at. Um, this is a book that I love. I just picked this one up two years ago and it's called You Are a Badass. This is just a motivational kind of a personal development, a self-help, a check-in with yourself on um, how to just stop doubting your greatness and living an awesome life. And, you know, we all second guess ourselves. It happens all the time. But in order to achieve greatness, we really do need to believe in ourselves and we need to break out of what I call the status quo. Um, and just my own personal 
uh, opinion on this is file away your self-limiting beliefs and go for it. Um, the one thing holding all of us back, I mean, everyone at every point, regardless of education, regardless of wealth, regardless of family, regardless of you name it, we all have self-limiting beliefs. And once we break those down and once we get past those, I think we achieve amazing greatness and that greatness creates this sense of an awesome feeling, awesome life. So another book that I would highly recommend, um, Jen Sincero, great author and makes some incredible points for self-worth in there. My fourth book is um, Behaviors Spread Like Viruses. Haha, <laughs> not to be, uh, <laughs> no pun intended on that one, but Gladwell defines the tipping point and I've read all his books, but it's that moment of critical mass, the threshold and the boiling point, right? So this book explains and describes the mysterious psychological changes that mark everyday life. Gladwell is key to being analytical. Everything he does is comparing to analytics, to facts, to trends. Um, so he talks about the rule of 150, he talks about being an expert and having so much time. A lot of our designers are experts. They have over 1500 hours, which was his benchmark in this book. Um, and so we consider ourselves experts when we have that type of, um, of time and value inside a particular um, uh, trade that we do. But this is ideas and products and messages, behaviors spreading like viruses do. So it's how little things make a big difference. One of my favorite, favorite books of all time. This is one I pick up every few years and just continue to try to get some more value out of the different uh, chapters or go back to my highlighted areas and places where I've uh, earmarked the page or wrote some notes. Like I said, put some scratch down there um, so I can go back to it. Another very valuable book. <clears throat> and then the fifth book, and this was one that was recommended from a friend of mine. And um, later, Steve Jobs ended up being quoted a lot in this book, which is um, so good they can't ignore you, right? And this is interesting because it talks about why skills trump passion in our quest for work we love. Now, when I talk to interior designers, and this is a daily occurrence for foyer folks, the one thing I realize is that so many of our interior design community, they just love what they do. They're passionate about design, aesthetics, the creative side, right? It's such a great group of practical creatives within the design community. So you have to be so good they can't ignore you. This is, this is really what it gets into as a person's talent and skill, not necessarily their passion determines their career path. So at the end of the day, matching your job to a pre-existing passion does not matter. Passion comes after you put in the hard work to become excellent at something valuable, not before. And I think Cal Newport does a very good job of challenging that thought process, which I very much valued and, and came to the conclusion that I fully agree with Cal in his, um, in his uh, recommendation there. So in other words, what you do for a living is much less important than how you do it. So again, follow your passion, not great career advice. Uh, passion comes after doing all of the, before we become excellent and put in all the hard works. Anyway, those are my five best books and I hope all of you have an opportunity to get those. None of those are super expensive so you can get them right online. All right, I'm going to um, stop sharing for a second here. And we are going to um, introduce our first guest. Um, today we have with us, uh, Leslie is gonna be our first guest, Myrick, on creating your signature style. Now, Leslie was with us for our two day foyer talks and um, there was a tremendous amount of feedback. Leslie, I thought was one of our best speakers, super excited to have her today. Um, loved her philosophy, definitely someone that gets how to work on the business, not just at the business, totally challenging status quo every chance she gets. So Leslie's an Atlanta interior designer. Her mission is to empower her clients to embrace what they love, make confident de design decisions. Um, she's helping achieving moms bust out of boring homes, brand new interior designers launch kick-ass businesses. As Leslie says, beige is boring and let's have some fun. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring on Leslie. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Rich. That was a very, very kind introduction. And I love what you were sharing with the books about working on the business, because that is a huge thing I am passionate about. And I love this topic of not only creating your signature style, figuring out what the heck it actually is, but also how do you communicate that? How do you get that across to your followers, to your fans, to your audience, and let them know what you are all about as a designer and really what you can do for them? So let me try to yeah, navigate the, the fun world of screen sharing. Let me see if I can get this to work. Da, da, da. You're probably just looking at my face, looking all confused right now. Sorry, guys. Hang tight. Almost there. Okay. So while this loads, obviously today. I think, Leslie, we, can you hear us? Let's just give her a second here. I just want to make sure quickly that you guys can still hear me. Did I drop out there? Something yeah, you weird? dropped out. We can, we can see and hear you now. Okay. Let me try again with the screen sharing because you got to love when this goes south with Zoom. Worked fine yesterday, of course. All right, That's how it always works. I know. Somewhere there's a presentation okay. here. All right. Can, can you guys see that now? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Let's hope this doesn't go away. So let's start with who the heck am I? So as Rich said, I'm an interior designer. I help high achieving moms bust out of boring homes. And I also help brand new designers create kick-ass businesses they love. I have been doing design for 15 years. It's what I always, always, always wanted to be doing, went to school for it, was just, you know, I'm that kid that I think a lot of you were, where you were rearranging your own furniture and decorating your room and kind of tapping into this idea of the value of the spaces that surround us from a very young age. It's something for me that has always been kind of intuitive and I, you know, I'm trained in it, but it's also just very, I feel it. I know what I like. I can't always put my finger on it, but that is what I am all about. So like I said, I've been working in design for 15 years. I started my career in Toronto. I'm actually Canadian. And I have since moved to California, Texas, and Georgia. So I have restarted my business three times, which is exhausting. But I have learned so much about how to get a business up and running. And that's why I share that with other designers. And a big part of that is knowing what you're about and how do you communicate that to people so they know who the heck you are when you show up in a new space. So that is how I can help you communicate your signature design style. I have always been passionate about branding and business building behind the scenes. And I know from starting over so many times moving across the country <laughs> that it is really important to have that brand and that aesthetic locked down so that you can share it confidently and people know what you're about. And your job on social, on website, on print collateral, whatever it might be where you're sharing part of your brand I can't remember who said this first, but it's such great advice. You either want to attract or repel people. It sounds crazy to choose to repel people, but the people you want to attract are your ideal clients. The people that are going to look at you and say, hell yeah, that is the designer I want to hire. And the people you want to turn away are people who will look at you and be like, no, thanks. I'm good. And I can tell you when I was living in Texas, in central Texas, fixer upper land, very conservative. You know, I'm the chick with the tattoos and the weird hair. And I was good at repelling people. <laughs> and hopefully I attracted some of the right ones. But I do think that's really important. And not only is it you, but also your work and how you present that. So today we are going to answer three really, really important questions about this topic. Number one, how do you define your signature style? Like how the heck do you even figure it out? Number two, once you know what you're into, how do you actually make that signature style happen in real life? And number three, say you've done some projects and they're in your style. How do you communicate that to other people? How do you let other people know what you're about and what you can bring as a designer? So let's start with number one. How do you define your signature style? It's not as hard as it sounds. <laughs> And it's not something that, you know, I fought this for years because I always thought I had to put like a name or like little, you know, fancy adjectives around what I did. And really 
your signature style, I mean, if you can package it up in some nice little words, great, but it is really about common threads in your past projects or in the work you want to be doing. I don't want you to feel like just because you've worked in a certain style or had a few projects under your belt, if they're not really, you know, making you sing, you can pivot, you can change that. But basically what I want you to do is look back through past projects. Look if there's any colors, textures, materials, finishes, styles, particular eras that you are drawn to and that you use over and over and over again. This having a signature style, this does not mean that every project is a carbon copy of another. This isn't formulaic. It's not, you know, you trying to be super repetitive, but I guarantee you, if you look back through some of your favorite projects that you've done, there are going to be common threads. For me, I use a lot of bold jewel tone colors. So teal, navy, and mustard are three I use a lot. I use a ton of colorful patterns. Hello, this room is an example. This is literally just a closet. <laughs> this is where I do recording and stuff. But even then, it communicates my signature style. And I use a lot of wallpaper, patterned wallpaper. And then I also balance that with textured neutrals. So, you know, wood with texture, shagreen, metal finishes, things that balance out the color and the pattern and the crazy. I don't have like a fancy name to wrap that up with, but if you look at my work, if you look, you know, over my Instagram feed or on my website, you're going to get that vibe communicated very clearly. My favorite colors, patterns, textures, and my style is all very clearly defined there. And I want to make the note here that this is not about trying to look at other people's work and figure out how you can be different or be the same or whatever that might be. Comparison is the thief of joy. And this is not something that I want you to feel like you need to be you know, holding your standard up to someone else's or looking around, seeing what everyone else does. This is the stuff that makes you, you, and it is best done when you are just looking internally, looking at past projects, really focusing, you know, keeping those blinders on and looking at you and your design firm and your aesthetic and figuring out what are the consistencies? What do you like to use over and over again? And what makes a project really feel like you? So this might take some brainstorming or this might be something that comes super easy to you and you're like, well, duh, I always use black and white and gray only. Cool. There you go. You've kind of got things figured out. That's the first step. Number two is how do you actually make that style happen in real life? And I want to share with you some advice that a business coach that I worked with shared with me that has, I mean, literally changed my life. It's on a post-it in my office right above my desk. And what she told me was focus on fabulous, not perfect. As designers, I don't know about you, but me, I feel like it is my job to go to the ends of the earth to exhaust every possible option for a project to make sure that I have the perfect solution that is on brand and meets the client's needs and does all that. And you really have to understand it's okay to let go of that. It's okay to aim for fabulous and not perfect. And one way that fabulous works for me is I know there are a million amazing vendors out there. I go to High Point, I see the showrooms, I am in love with everything. But to do my job well, to have a signature style that is respected and appreciated and sought after, I need to focus. I need to sort of come up with, and this is one of the biggest tips I can offer you, a go-to vendors list. Maybe it's 20 to 30, maybe even fewer vendors that you know you can go to over and over and over again, build those great relationships. And these vendors are in this, you know, aesthetic, the price point, the quality, the lead times, all the things that you value as a designer and are in line with what you want to offer your clients. It means you might miss out on some options. And for me, that's okay. I am choosing to aim for fabulous. I know what I'm about. I know what I like to see in my projects. I know what my clients want from me and expect when they work from me. And so having this narrow list takes so much of the overwhelm out when starting a project. And it means that I can get to that end result quickly, efficiently, and completely deliver on what the client is hoping to get from me. And that really is what is important. It's about fabulous, not perfection. And your signature style is fabulous. And this is a way you can actually take that kind of nebulous idea 
of what you're into and what your brand is and make it a reality. So, okay, say you've figured out some common threads in your projects. You know that you like this texture, this color, this aesthetic. You kind of have this, you know, I don't even know what you'd call it, a thing. You've got your thing. You're like, this is my thing. I'm doing my thing. Let's talk about how to actually communicate that with people and make it happen in real life. There are lots of ways to do that. And what I'm going to start with is by talking about branding. Now, this isn't interior design specific, but this is a huge helpful tip. If you're feeling like your social media feed or your website is kind of all over the place, to come up with a set of brand standards that you can use consistently everywhere. You'll see that my brand colors, my logo, are exactly the same colors I like to use in my project. Teal, mustard, some neutrals. I have two fonts that I use everywhere all the time. Really consistent. It's not complicated. And this just makes sure that no matter what I do and how I present it, when I'm, you know, if I'm adding text on an image, if I'm doing a colored overlay, if there's something that I'm doing that involves sort of the graphic design aspect of communicating my style, it's all going to be within this framework, which is a really helpful starting point. Again, it's about fabulous, not perfect. And this really helps narrow down so you know exactly how to start communicating your style to other people. But let's talk about actual images. And I want to say something super, super important. I know you need content. We all do. We all need things to share on social to be relevant, to keep up with the demand. But please, 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 number one, understand that less is more. Don't put a bunch of crap out there just to fill the space. If it doesn't feel on brand and if it's not communicating what you want to be putting out there as a designer, don't share something that is not in your style that feels off brand as it were. Make sure that you are really showing work or images, whatever they might be, lifestyle images that feel like you and your brand and your signature style. The other thing I want to talk about, and I have done this, so I'm totally confessing I'm guilty of this. Please do not borrow images from other designers and regram them or share them on your feed. It is so misleading to go to another designer's feed and see this beautiful work and they've got all these followers and they look massively successful. And you find out that like every other image is borrowed from another designer. I admit I did this when I first started because I wanted, I needed more images and I wanted to communicate the look I was going for, but that's not the right way to do it. Please don't do that. There's many, many other ways to create images in your signature style for your unique content. And I'm going to talk about a few ways you can do that. If you don't have any whole home projects yet or even full room projects yet to share that feel like they're in line with your style, you can in your own home or a friend's home or wherever looks good to you, just style a vignette. You don't need the whole room. You can do a coffee table. You can do a dresser in a bedroom. You can do a bookshelf. People love bookshelf styling. That goes crazy on the internet. And if you can find a way to do these things that are in your signature style that show the elements, you'll see here deep jewel tones, textured wood, metallics, there's saturated color, no pattern here, but the wall has textured paneling. So this to me feels really in line with my aesthetic and I would be happy to share this little vignette even though it's not a full room shot. Another thing you can do is a brand photo shoot. So think of this as making your own stock photography. You can hire a pro and they are worth it. Or honestly, if this is something you need to bootstrap, grab a designer friend and swap take pictures of each other and it's going to be really, really helpful. So, you know, in your, maybe in your office, show you working at your desk, laying out some materials. Maybe you want pictures of you out and about at your favorite vendors with backgrounds that sort of show the, you know, the, the style of furnishings and decor and lighting and whatever that you want featured. But creating your own photography for this can be very, very helpful when you are lacking on actual finished project photos to communicate your style. Flat lays, because everyone loves a friggin' flat lay. They are easy. You can shoot them in your office on your iPhone. Simple photo editing software. There's so many tips online to do these well and to do these inexpensively. And I think people feel like, oh, if I'm only doing these kind of DIY photos, it's not as legit 
as if I'm showing a full room project, but this is the kind of stuff clients and homeowners love to see. They want to see your taste. They want to see how you mix texture and color and pattern, how you mix different aesthetics and flat lays and kind of mood board type stuff is so, so successful. So please don't feel like this is some sort of lesser option. This is absolutely a way that you can gather great materials that you want to use and show people, hey, this is what I'm capable of. And this is the kind of stuff I love to work with. In a pinch, you can also use stock photography as long as you are using it, you know, within the licensing capabilities and the realms that you are granted for that. I say go for it. Unsplash.com is my favorite. I tend to find stuff that just works. But one thing I want to let you know is when you're using stock photography, try to stay away from interiors because, again, it kind of gets into that misleading territory of sharing something that looks like your work, but it isn't actually your work. And so even though it's a stock photo and you're able to use it, it's just kind of that gray area that I think is better left. Let's not just have any confusion there. But this is an opportunity to do lifestyle photos, communicate the fun side of your brand or your love for color or whatever it might be. You can find some great pictures that feel like they're going to go with your feed and your signature style. And again, they're not interiors, but that's all part of you and your brand and how you communicate that. Another way that I have communicated my style, and I do this for clients, is 2D mood boards. Canva.com is a great tool for that. With the premium Canva, they have a background remover tool, which has changed my life because I used to do this all in Photoshop and manually remove backgrounds and it was torture. So if this is something you want to do, grab graphics from the internet, you know, grab different furniture and decor and throw it all in. It looks great. But if you want to up level it, I want to show you this is the same room rendered in foyer and I think it's a lot stronger. <laughs> the mood boards are great. People love seeing 2D stuff. I share these on my Instagram feed all the time. But there is such power in visualization and creating renderings that are really simple and beautiful to communicate what you are about to people. I think someone could see either one of these. I'm just going to go back a sec. And kind of get the sense of what the room is going to be and how it's going to feel. But that's so much more powerful to see it in the space in 3D. And people are very quickly aware of what you are capable of as a designer when they can see it imagined out in 3D. So that's a great resource. And obviously, you know about Foyer because you're here. And I'm super happy with how that room turned out. It's so cool. It looks just like the real room. I cannot wait to photograph it and share final pictures. And so I want to mention something else sort of as a bonus tip. We've already run through the questions. But you still might be thinking, okay, great, but I don't have a project to create a mood board for or a 3D rendering for, and I don't want my feed to just be, you know, flat lays of things I like over and over and over again. And so one tip I want to offer you, and I have done this before, there is no shame in this game, is create a spec project. Pretend it's a real project, design the floor plan, pick all the furniture and decor, make up an entire client as if it is a real project, put it in foyer, make a rendering, do a flat lay, use a little bit of time to create something that is in your signature style so that you can share it. You know, use the jewel tones, use the metallics, find things that you really would want to use in a real project and make it up. No one needs to know that it is not a real paying client. And this is such a good way for you to kind of get your feet wet play around with this new style, get comfortable with it. See if there are vendors that you find that you're like, yeah, this totally lines up. They've got case goods and lighting and soft furnishings that all work well for my brand. I know they're going to be a go-to for me. This is an awesome time to just play around and explore. For me, and I'm guessing for a lot of you too, design is really intuitive. And of course, we do understand color and balance and you know the elements and principles of design like we got that but this is such a fun opportunity to play and figure out okay like if I didn't have a real client if I didn't have all the restrictions that I do right now what would I create what would I design would it have a giant hot pink rug and geometric curtains would it have whatever you want in it and so 
you don't need to have real houses with real photos to be a solid designer with a solid style and be able to communicate what you are about and what sets you apart from other people. So I know that was a fire hose of information, Anya, but I'm going to let you know I have a few other ways that I can help you with this, with the branding, with communicating, and help you create a kick-ass business you love. I do coach brand new designers who are launching their businesses. We have a six-month coaching and business document program. It's amazing, and it's such a quick way to go from zero to really hitting the ground running. I've also got a couple of free resources for you. Every Monday, I send out my badass biz tips, and they're just quick, actionable things you can do every week to keep business moving forward, to work on the business, as Rich said, and focus on that behind the scenes stuff so that you can really attract these amazing clients who are wanting your signature style. And if you need help with your consultation calls, you know, converting clients on the phone to paying clients, I have a free consultation call script and all those things you see are at lesliemeyerk.com slash coaching. So you go, you can go check that out there. I would love to see you over there. And I think I might have left a bit of extra time, which is great, but we do have time for questions. So I would love to hear what you guys have to say and offer any more, you know, advice and tips on this topic. Yep. Leslie, it's Rich. Um, we have a question here. How do I figure out what my go-to vendors are? That is a great question. So this took me a while because like I said, I'd been to High Point, I'd been to Vegas, I'd been to Dallas Market, and I've seen all the vendors and there's amazing stuff in there. But what I found is I tend to gravitate towards a few that... I just, I really liked, they tended to have a lot of things I could work with, not just one or two pieces that I thought were cool, but there was a good range of products they had that were in a price point that I was comfortable with selling to my clients. I was happy with the quality and they really did line up with my aesthetic. And so some of this is just trial and error and figuring stuff out. I've ordered from some vendors and it's not been a great process. So I have not used them again. But I do like to take a look at what's out there. I think going to market when they're, you know, there's not a pandemic, going to markets is a great time to go see things, touch things, sit on things, see what you like in person. It's very different looking at things completely online versus actually putting your butt on a chair and getting a sense of the scale and the feel and the quality. I also find with go-to vendors, the more stuff I can see in person from that brand, the more confident I am using it and presenting it to clients because I know it's going to meet their needs physically and also just aesthetically. So it is a bit of trial and error. I, if you're really brand new to procuring or sourcing, you know, if retail is one thing, but if you're looking for wholesale, there's, I mean, there's great Facebook communities that you can ask questions of. I'm happy to let people know some of my go-tos if they want to contact me after this. And this has been something that's taken a while and I'm sort of constantly tweaking and refining adding, you know, cool new vendors as they come up, but also kind of taking some off my list that I find just haven't really been meeting that need. Okay. Thank you. Makes sense. Another one came in um, for a new graduate, just starting out. Um, what advice would you give them if they wanted to start to freelance? That's an awesome question. So I'm assuming then they're probably not looking to work. Well, I'm curious about freelance. Is this like sort of part-time or start your own business. I'm guessing freelance meaning. Um, yeah, like, I'm thinking like, let's let's start your own business and start out freelancing. I think that's a, a great place to start. As a designer who's been doing this 15 years, I'm not out of touch, but I'm also not as up to date on, you know, current software. There's certain things out there that just aren't my strength as much from learning software and stuff 15 years ago. So what I tend to need help with as a designer is um, more of like the technical side of stuff, some sourcing, but if you have skills in, you know, design software, if you're able to do input, help put together proposals, you know, just sort of be of true assistance to the designer and not assume that you're going to be jumping into design right away. For me, I you know, if a student or someone just out of school reaches out and they offer skills in that realm, that's a huge help to me. I do think there's value in working for a firm full time. But if you are just looking to freelance and kind of fill in the gap, I would just be, you know, willing to 
offer what you have, but also understand that a designer probably isn't going to hire someone who's just starting to freelance to do the sourcing and like the real vision of the company. But if you can really offer to support a designer and help them meet their needs and their goals, that's going to give you a huge leg up in getting in the door with people. Yeah. And, and Jessica, who's one of our other speakers coming on next, um, also said work for a firm. So she kind of reiterated that as well. Um, another question that came in is, how do I make my own photos look as good as professional pictures? Oh, that is a great question. It is hard because there's a reason professionals are professionals. But that being said, we all have pretty phenomenal cameras in our pockets all the time. And what I find to be really useful is there is, I keep, they always have ads on my Instagram. It's a company called Light and Airy Photog, I think. And I bought some of their presets, which have been really helpful. If you're not familiar with presets, Lightroom has them, I, similar to Photoshop, where you plug in a photo and it's like a filter, but it adjusts things and makes it look better. And so I have presets built in on my phone that allow any picture I take to get the same treatment, which helps things look more consistent across all my all my visuals. I will say if you're talking about interior photos specifically or flat lays, a couple tips that I have learned from working in photo studios, doing styling, and also just from doing it on my own, only natural light, turn off all artificial lights, make sure you go to a place where you have good light coming in, but not so direct, but artificial light makes a photo look DIY and cheap all the way. Professionals never have lights on in photos. And make sure when you're shooting, verticals are vertical. That's a dead giveaway in DIY photos when, you know, think your camera's a bit crooked and things are a little off. Really get those verticals lined up tight. And it's a small tweak, but leveling and straightening your photos is going to make them look a lot more professional. It's one of those little subtle things that we don't even realize we pay attention to, but it makes a huge difference in photography. Excellent. Thank you. Here's another one. This is a, I love this uh, question. Is it okay for my signature style to change over time or will that alienate my followers? That is tricky because I can understand feeling like if you've built a brand based on a certain look or style and you sort of start to pivot, yes, it could, but I don't think that's a bad thing. It goes back to this idea of attracting or repelling your goal when you're communicating on Instagram or your website or Facebook or in emails or in print, whatever it might be, anytime you're putting something out there, you want to show things that are going to attract the people to you that want what you are offering. And it's going to kind of let other people go like, no, that chick's not for me. That's really not what I'm looking for. And so changing, pivoting, yeah, you might lose a few people. But I can tell you, if they were ever going to become clients, you're going to hate the project and it's not going to be a look you want to do. And it's going to keep dragging you down to be building a business based on something that isn't authentic to you. So definitely don't worry about that. You might lose some people, let them go and just keep going forward and really tune into what you want and makes you feel expansive and excited when you're working on it and keep on going and be authentic in that way. I think you're going to attract more people by doing that, even if you do lose some. Excellent. Um, here's another one. What if I'm a brand new designer and don't have any project experience to know what my signature style is? That's a great chance to do a spec project, to make something up, figure out, you know, what city do you want to be working in? What neighborhood are you attracted to? What do those homes typically look like? Can you, you know, pretend to design a few rooms in the home, do a mood board, do a 3D rendering and foyer, make it convincing. And the point is not to trick people into thinking you have all these big fancy paying clients. It really is to hone your style and your skills and be able to tune into what you like, put a little package around it and show people, hey, this is what I can do. It's okay, you haven't actually done it in real life yet because we all have to start somewhere. My first kitchen remodel was my first kitchen remodel. I had never done one and I figured it out as I went. And I think being resourceful and being creative goes a long way. Don't get intimidated by the fact that, you know, you don't have projects under your belt yet. Everybody is starting somewhere and playing. It might sound silly, but this idea of just like, 
playing and having fun and exploring and creating without the pressure of a paying client and deadlines is such a good way to tune in and hone down what you love and start putting, you know, that framework around your signature style. Excellent. I have a, one of my own questions just as a follow-up to that, Leslie. If, if it's my first project, I'm probably going to be a little timid to ask for any type of money up front. What kind of advice would you give me around setting expectations on my fee or my, you know, deposit, so to say, up front? I completely understand the fear of not wanting to ask for money up front, but professionals ask for money up front and you will be taken more seriously as a designer if you have a contract and if you have a fee structure in place. I know it feels weird, especially when you're new because you just want to like do the project and I'll send you a bill later and we're all good. But I can tell you, I, I worked with a photographer and he was great. We just chatted by email and we booked a date. And he never asked me for money and never sent me a contract. And I was like, is this gonna, like, is this guy legit? Like, are we gonna actually get pictures that we can use? Like, what's happening here? And he was great. He followed through. All was fine. But I realized the perception I had was, you know, I don't know if I can trust him to deliver on the outcome. He doesn't seem serious about his business and how things run. So I do think it's important to collect some sort of retainer to start. If you're doing hourly, you might wanna consider, you know, our projects have a 10 hour minimum or 20 hour minimum, and that's X dollars due up front to initiate the project. If you do flat fee, I typically do 50% up front and then 50% at the concept design presentation. So my fees are really front loaded, but people have, you know, put some, put their money where their mouth is to get started with me. And then they've seen the concept design. They think they see where things are going and they're happy to pay that balance and get it done so that we can finish up the project strong. So don't be afraid to have some parameters in place, but you know, if asking for 10 grand out the gate stance sounds like too much, said maybe it's 10 hours to start. That's, you know, gets people in the door. You've got that money in your pocket. You know, they're serious. They know you're serious and you're going to deliver on what you've promised because there's, there's money involved. That's important. Yep. Excellent advice. Um, here's an interesting one. Should I create a personal brand under my name or create a separate entity? That's a very awesome question. I think that really depends if you are trying to create a design firm with you as the designer, Leslie Myrick Art and Design, obviously it's my name, versus, you know, a company with, you know, I don't know, feathered nest interior, something that's not your name that you could potentially sell later if you have that kind of vision for the business. And so for me, I, I guess I would consider myself a personal brand in the sense that I am the name and the face behind the company and me is the business and everything is very intertwined. But if you wanted your business to be feel a little bit more separate, and I understand some people don't want to be as mixed in, you could consider sort of having both. But honestly, for me, for time and just for practical reasons, I am happy to have my Instagram. I mean, my Instagram is fully professional. Don't get me wrong here. Like, you know, if I put pictures of my kids in or things like that, they're on brand, they look good, they're photographed well. And that's deliberate because I want people to see the lifestyle aspect of me. I market to high achieving moms. I am also a mom. So I think that works, but it really depends on what you want to communicate and the kind of clients you're trying to attract, whether or not you want to keep you separate from say a brand Instagram feed. Yeah, I love that. You, you've taken your perfect profile prospect and then actually can cater your, um, your brand and what you're doing to that. It makes total sense. Yeah. Um, here's another one that just came in. Do you ever go over budget where they would need to give you more money at the end? Boy, I'd love to take that, but I'm going to let you have it. <laughs> okay. I have in the past and I don't do it that way anymore. So I think I saw Jessica chiming in in the chat and I'm really in agreement with her on this. She mentioned something about 50% up front and I said, I'm the same way. And so the way we do our process, super high level here with our design fees, 50% up front, 50% at the concept design presentation. Then we do the detailed design at that presentation. They owe us a hundred percent of the cost of goods that we're doing. That's it. 
there's nothing, there's nothing else. We're not a bank. We're not going to bankroll them while they pay us in cute little deposits. And it sounds scary because I started working in the land of, we only asked for 50% and then we collect 25 and 25. And then it meant that sometimes invoices came in and we didn't have the cash to cover it. And so like, if you go to, I don't know, the grocery store, you're not going to get to pay 50% now and 25% in a week. Like, no, whatever goods we sell, we sell, here's your proposal. 100% is due for us to initiate the orders. We include shipping on that. We include white glove. There should not be, and I use air quotes, obviously, over a budget. That being said, if the client changes the scope, if they add something, if something changes, there certainly could be, you know, you've spec something, it was in stock, you go to order it, it's out of stock, you have to reselect, and it's $1,000 more. There could be sort of an outlier like that, but generally there is not over budget at the end. And that has come from years of getting burned with this. So I say this out of love is that I've switched to this because it makes such a difference in the outcome of the project and the relationship you have with that client and how the process goes. If you can really be upfront with the money, front load it. And then they're so thrilled at the end because there's not outstanding invoices and nickel and diming and those little piddly things that just kind of sour the end of a really beautiful experience. Yeah, perfect. That was great advice. Spot on. And we're going to have, we have a couple more minutes. So I just want to throw this one out there. When clients get a little too involved and start designing and get involved in the design process process themselves, how do you handle that situation? Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's, that's real. Okay. Something that I have come to accept over the past couple of years working with a business coach, I've worked with several and they're all so valuable for what they've taught me. But one thing this coach taught me was we as designers have to let go of the outcome. And that's hard because all of us are like, do the project, full service, install, style, photograph, boom, we're killing it. But ultimately it's their house and their money and you can't strong arm them to not buy some dumb piece of art they saw at a flea market they fell in love with. So the the um, communication I have with my clients at the beginning is, you know, we have a plan. We're working with a certain vision. We're honoring your budget. Like we got this, but if you find something you absolutely love or want to include, bring it to our attention and we'll work with it. We just need to know. I think it's when clients throw a wrench in when you've done the whole design plan and they're like, oh, by the way, we bought this sofa on sale. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense with my whole design plan. So it is tricky. And there are some clients that you can gently guide them back to sanity. But ultimately, I have done plenty of projects that aren't photographed because it's their home and they've gone rogue and it's sometimes a fight not worth having. So that's where something like foyer or mood boards or whatever other visuals can fill the gap. Even if you don't get a project photo at the end of everything, it's okay. Because as long as you've gotten paid well for your time, for your expertise, and you've delivered what you promised to the client and they're happy, that's ultimately more important than the photo. So sometimes you just kind of have to let it go. It's frustrating. I know because I've been there but you can't said you can't strong arm somebody into doing it your way. It's their house. All right, excellent. That's perfect. That takes us right to the 250. We did a great job of fitting in a whole bunch of content um, in that 40 minutes. So awesome work. Um, we had a lot of good stuff through the chat. I think I got to everybody's questions. I hope I did. Um, I was trying to filter them through the Q and A as well as the chat. But great. Uh, plethora of information, Leslie, as usual. So thank you so much. My pleasure, Rich. Thank you for having me. This has been such a pleasure. Excellent. Have a good day. You too. All right. Our next guest here, um, let me to introduce her, Jessica uh, Archival. Now, Jessica has been very active in the chat today with some really good tips um, and speaking her opinion, uh, which mirrors a lot of what Leslie was saying. So we can see two top designers with very, very similar feedback to our group, which is great to see the consistency there. Um, Jessica is going to talk to us about creating a winning design process for luxury um, projects. So Jessica is the owner of her own turnkey boutique design studio where she specializes in high-end residential 
and commercial interiors. So with that, we are going to bring Jessica on with us. My team should be bringing Jessica on any second. All right, give us give us just a few seconds here while we get Jessica situated. Uh, second. I know she was in the chat because she was very vocal in the chat. So she was on with us. She might be having a technical difficulty, but we'll get her back on here in a second. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry about that. My, uh, my computer died. <laughs> I was going to say you went from being very vocal in the chat to non-existent. So I yeah, knew. I like, oh my God, my computer yeah. just died. What are the odds right when I'm supposed to get on? It's the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I, I get used to tap dancing when we're on Zoom calls. <laughs> <laughs> did I miss my introduction? You did, but it was amazing and everyone was oh, cheering. Okay, great. So great, great, great. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, great. So let me be quick because last time I did this thing, I, I didn't get to the questions. Um, so I want to, one, I want to share my screen. Am I sharing my screen right now? Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Perfect. Share. Um, you full screen mode. <clears throat> All right, we're here. Everybody can hear me, right? We can hear you. Yep, we can see okay, your great. Uh, screen. Great, great, great. Okay, so let me just start by telling people a little bit about me. Um, so I've gone the traditional route in the sense that I've you know studied. I went to college. I then went to work for a firm. I know there was talk about it. I wrote some notes. There was talk about um, you know leave, getting out of college and starting your own business. I disagree with doing that. I think that that would be one, it, it'd be a disadvantage to you as a designer because you're starting your brand and you have no experience. You don't know how to run a business. Uh, you don't know how long things take, how much they cost. Uh, you don't have any networks, you don't have any vendors and you could potentially cause damage to your build, like your business and your brand um, by taking on clients without having that credential, that experience. And eventually one, it could discourage you. You may not make the progress you wanna make, so I'm fully suggesting <clears throat> for you to work for somebody who's been doing it, gain your knowledge, understand, uh, go through the motions. Like everybody, I mean, I just being like a millennial, I have just a very traditional old school perspective on things. A lot of people just want like instant gratification. They just like want to wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a designer. Let me be successful. <clears throat> That's great if you want to manifest that, good luck. But at the end of the day, you have to have substance, you have to have knowledge, and you have to go through the proper uh, channels in order to be efficient and be able to talk talk your talk. Um, so that's one. Another thing <clears throat> I want to piggyback on is unlike certain people, like, you know, you want to have a brand and you want to have an image. For me, I personally enjoy being a chameleon. I like to be the brand. And that just goes back to me in corporate. So I worked for um, one of the top 100 firms in the country. And I basically was running their design department and I worked for a lot of high-end brands. Um, and so I was used to branding and working with these high-end brands and you have to become them. You have to, when I'm working for coach, I'm coach. When I'm working for, you know, Valentino, when I'm working with uh, Rag and Bone and Kate Spade, you become that brand. That's what makes you different is you have to be able to like morph. You can't just be one thing because one thing gets boring. You got to be multiple things. You got to be able to, to embody, embody the brand. And so that was what was most fun about working at the firm that I worked at is that we worked with all of these different retailers. So I got to understand their philosophies. I got to, you know, understand their brands and make sure that we're being, we're embodying the brand when we design for them, when we design their fixtures. And that's what makes it fun because I think that when you work for one thing and you do one thing too long, you start to get very bored. Um, so it makes it a little bit more exciting when you start to say like, okay, I'm, I'm this now. So for instance, like I've worked on 
Um, so one of my projects was Trump Plaza. So you can imagine that that's like a different caliber than me doing uh, Nail Lounge, which is another one of my clients. So it's fun to kind of hop around and be able to show the versatility as a creative. So don't like subject yourself to one look and one aesthetic, go, like, you know, marinate, go do different things, get excited about different things and also push your envelope and, and you know, start to really dive into different, different aesthetics and different designs. Um, so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna, kind of take it way back and go to the beginning of when I decided that designing is branding, is concept, that all of these things are cohesive. Because a lot of the times we would work with some brands who had like a brand development and they'd have a package and then they'd come to us and say, design a store, um, you know, design our store, this is our brand. And then there were other ones that came with like a logo and said like, this is our logo. We want to open up uh, a retail location. This is what we sell. And this is our logo. Can you design a store for us. So now we're, well, me coming up with this idea of a creative, like, okay, who the hell are these people? What are they selling? Where are they from? Um, you know, who makes the the brand? So I did a, I did a brand called Wakol. They're in Short Hills. Um, it's a bra company and they're out of Japan. And they're usually were in like retail stores like Macy's and stuff like that. So now they're, they're gonna build their first brick and mortar. And I had the luxury to be able to design their store. Um, so we had to like really meet the team and understand who they were, where the product came from and then create this brand based on like, here are our bras and this was what we sell. So we really had like nothing and we had a logo that was basically their name so that's the fun part about creating branding and that's what I'm going to go into right now I'm going to go into like not just being so surface level like I feel like nowadays like anybody can make something look beautiful but like what does it do for you like what kind of emotion does it uh give you like um does it does it move you like that's what you want to do how abstract is it like what elements are you bringing in on a design uh, level that's that's speaking back to the brand so <clears throat> I just gave five keys I think the first thing you want to do is connect with your client um, hold on, let me move this up here. You want to connect with your client and you want to understand their needs. I mean, that's like base level stuff. Like, okay, what do you guys need? And like, who the hell am I working with type of thing? Like you need to understand your client because that's how you're going to be able to like vibe with them. Like if you don't have a really good connection, you guys aren't communicating well, and you're like, you know, just kind of like really stiff about it. It's going to be an awkward, an awkward process. Set the tone as the designer because they're hiring you. So be firm in who you are you know, be aggressive, set the tone, let them know, like, this is how the show goes. And this is how it goes when I run it. And that's just, it's just what it is. And be confident because they're going to see your energy and be like, all right, this girl's like, you know, she has really good energy. She's cool. She knows what she's talking about. And then you make it fun. And that that's when you make decisions. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is connect with the community and the local culture. Anytime I go on a job site, I'm like looking around, like what's going on? What kind of restaurants are here? What kind of people are here? What are our views like? How are the people? How are you guys functioning? Um, I bring in like local designers from, you know, artists from the area. Like I like to do local flair kind of stuff. I like to bring in community. Um, Cause again, now you're bringing substance into your design. You're like, you're enabling a certain behavior and culture to happen. Um, create a brand story. Like I literally could brand anything. Like I can just take this cup and be like, all right, this is the brand. And I'll just create this whole story based on this cup. And people will be like, this is a great brand that you got. I don't even know who makes this cup, but that's not the point. The point is looking outside of like what you can visually see. <clears throat> Once you create the brand and the story, and I'm going to show you guys a project I did, which is like the first project I did in corporate that I started to combine branding and design. And then from there, when I went off to start my own business, I just kept that caliber across the board. Um, so you create a brand and you create a brand story, right? And then from there, the key is to personify the brand. I love this word, persona, personify, personification. So what that means is like, like giving like a feeling, a visual to something that's really like not a physical thing. Um, so when you personify the brand, you're bringing in like language, brand messaging, um, you know, materials, art, uh, you know, it just goes down to all of even the abstract elements that you start to put the brand together. And I'll show you guys that when I pu pull up the presentation. Um, and then customize the design and make it unique, make it an experience, like really do cool stuff that people don't do so that they remember you so that people in the building or wherever you're designing, uh, I do more commercial work. So, you know, less residential, but even residential, I'm like throwing in neon signs. Like I have one client who always says like, 
uh, it's not love you always, love you infinity to her daughters. And so I was like, this is so cool. Like in their playroom, I was like, we're doing a neon sign that says love you infinity. And so they see it when they walk in, the girls are around it. So it's like really a cool, intimate connection like for the family, but it's also something she tells her girls every single day. So that emotion, like when she made, made the space for them, we made it really fun. And then we put that little moment that like connects them with their mom. Like they'll always, you know, their mom tells them that every single day, like love you infinity, love you infinity. So and that's what I'm talking about when we talk about bringing branding and elements and having the design give emotion back. So uh, that was like a little, that's a cute story. Shout out Griggs. Um, okay, uh, so let me show you guys, I wanna show you guys this <clears throat> uh, presentation. So let me go all the way to the top. Uh, I'm keeping uh, the company that I work for and um, the company that we, we collabed with on here. <clears throat> Let me just get this into full screen. Display. Oh, that's why. Close. View. <clears throat> full screen mode. Okay, so just the background. It was really cool. I didn't know uh, Leslie was from Canada. So, howdy. Um, I am, so Spirit Leaf is a brand out in Canada. They're a dispensary. And so this guy, this guy comes to our firm he sold watches and he's like, I think the cannabis industry is going to be super great. Um, I want to open up a dispensary, but I don't want to do any kind of dispensary. I want to be the first person to franchise a dispensary, which means people bought into this concept that I created. I'm going to go through it with you guys. Um, 250 franchisee owners and they just span right across Canada and they're freaking killing it. They take on awesome locations. So look, look them up. Um, Darren is the CEO of this company, great guy. Like everything is from Canada except me, which is pretty freaking awesome. So um, look at them. I'm gonna go through the design and kind of everything that I done conceptually. They came to us with this logo and like three colors. It was like this brown, the green and the yellow. And they were like, that's what we got and we're gonna be a dispensary. So we're looking for you to create the vision. You could see the date, January 25th, 2018. <clears throat> So I started looking up images. I'm like, all right, cool. They're in Canada. They're out of Calgary, which is like a lot of outdoors. So I start bringing up this imagery of like, who's their brand? Like, what does it feel like to go to Spirit Leaf? What kind of energy do you have? They were just like very free, cool people. So we want to make sure I was like, all right, I got to embody this. I got to figure out like, you know, how are these people? Are they, are they adventurous? And like really bringing a brand and a lifestyle to cannabis because cannabis has been looked at in not this kind of um, light. I mean, now it's gonna be legal in New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey, by the way, guys. So, you know, it's making its way through the States and, and Canada's definitely accepted it before a lot of people have, but what we're doing is creating these brands. So like, just like you would work with, you know, the coaches in the rag and bones of the world and they have brands, I had to take that language and then incorporate it and now create a brand for, for dispensaries. <clears throat> this was the look and feel. So we put the materials together of like everything that we were choosing. We used their color palette. This was the color palette they came to us with. And then I selected all these materials like outdoor materials, um, bringing in concretes, bringing in woods uh, and starting to build an aesthetic. Um, and so just, you know, sometimes when you do these, you want to put out some words, fresh, airy, modern, travel, nostalgic. Uh, I love the word nostalgic because when you come into the space, you want to be reminded of your travels. You want to be reminded of being in the, in the outdoors and just being free and bringing nature. And, you know, nature is obviously going to be the most healing place. They say, you know, having your feet on the ground, having your feet rooted into the earth, into the, into like our existence, it's like energy going through your body. So what we want to do is take that energy from nature, captivate it, bring it into this interior and have have people feel that energy when they're in when they're inside the space <clears throat> so let me talk to you a little bit about branding and why I did certain things that, that I did when I was designing so a big thing you could see here in the rendering is that I've used multiple different kinds of floors and the reason I do that is so that we could brand and create locations so this design is essentially going to go into different locations and it's going to have to be modified it's called like retrofitting um, prototypes so we come up with a prototype which is this this is at our ideal location and then from there what we need to do I want to keep my time on on point hour uh, at three o'clock from there what we what we need to decide is like if this goes into a square box because they can't get a rectangle what does that look like so in order to have these languages they'll be able to understand so that for the reception i always wanted to do a brick floor um i'll show you what that design looks like so every store you'd go into you'd have this floor pattern in the reception and as a brand and a franchise you understand the language um the hey, jessica yeah 
Are you are you still on the concept design and the um, sprint leaf um, main page with January twenty fifth? No, I'm switching. Are you not seeing anything? No, it, it it stood still. Could you just stop uh, screen sharing for? Oh, there it is. Decorative oh, RCP. Yeah. yeah, now we can see it. Oh, you guys didn't see anything I was talking about. <clears throat> Just for the past, like maybe a minute and a half. Have you seen this slide? Uh, no. Oh man, so that's why it doesn't make any sense. Sorry about that. Good thing you chimed in. All right, I'm gonna roll that back really quick. Yeah. Um, so this this was the imagery I put together to start building the brand. I was talking about like, what do these people look like? What do they feel like? What's the energy, nature, traveling? So that's how I started because I'm like, this brand has nothing. So I sent a, a, a ton of photos and then I sent my Q ones here um, and they loved it. And then from there, I went on to pick materials. Like, what am I going to pick? That's going to, you know, embody the brand, et cetera. So that's where this slide comes in. You guys can see this awaken your inner spirit, nostalgic travel, modern, fresh air. This is a color palette. And then all of the materials that we selected. Um, yes. This is the floor plan I was talking about how the flooring is dictating different parts. This is branding within the design branding within like the prototype so uh, creating these different areas and so that way it can be transformed into any kind of space which when you do like branding on a commercial level most of these people are going to start to open multiple locations so they need like a design viable that they can stay by and understand and keep moving forward so that you have brand um, cohesiveness through across the board. Um, again, this is, these are examples of just my packaging in general. I do the same thing at my business here. Um, it's all been pretty cohesive lighting. What are the decorative lighting, where are their locations at? Um, and then here, I love to do this. I love to render elevations. I help, I feel like it gives you the vibe of the space. You're able to understand conceptually, you know, just where things are, what they look like, the materials. Um, and then it helps with the branding. So you could see, I've thrown in some brand images in here. I br brought in some brand messaging. So good times are here. That's like one of the things they said. So that's what I'm talking about when you bring in brand and then you personify the brand as you take these abstract ideas and start to bring them into the interior. And this could be done on any commercial level. Level. It doesn't have to be necessarily a dispensary. Um, you know, creating wayfinding. So this was one of my favorite. Can you see my mouse? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where the chat is. But yes. this, yeah, this moment right here, it was one of my favorite moments. So they had given us a package of how they came across building their, their logo. So this is actually the transformation that the logo went through before it became Spirit Leaf. And so I wanted to really take that brand moment and capitalize on it and, and bring it into the story. So the minute you walk into to the, to the retail location, you get that brand embodiment, you get that story behind, this is where we were, this is what we became, and this is who we are now. Um, and so it has a very powerful meaning to the people of the brand, to the community, and to obviously the franchisee owners as well. We have brand awareness. The minute you come in, you see the brand, you understand it, you feel it. Uh, that's what makes a really impactful design. And that's what I'm trying to get you know, past is being more than just uh, surface level beauty, taking those elements and really starting to, you know, capitalize on, on what the brand is. Um, here are some elevations. Again, this helps you realize what the sectors are, how things are broken up. We, you know, just doing the wayfinding like this on any kind of design, it helps, you know, putting the little labels. Um, again, this is the checkout area, the design, it's all in elevation, the logos, materials that we used. Uh, same here. So because of the regulations, we aren't able to have straight up views from the street, which means if people are walking past this dispensary, they can't physically see inside. So what we created was this really cool graphic logo. So when you're in the space, you see these really cool views. And when you're outside, you'll see the scenic view, but you can't see inside. And when you're inside, you can see outside, but when you're outside, you can't see inside. But this is the image you would see. So using graphics, using vinyls, transparencies, that's all really good for one branding for creating environments and they're also really cool because you can change them out they're not that expensive so you can create different moods in different environments and that's what we want to do for here i wanted to create flexibility for them um so that's that and then let me these are renderings so i'm always big on doing renderings that's why i love foyer and uh you know i always talk about just for me but back in the day when I was in corporate, we used to like say, oh, if you want a rendering, it costs X amount of dollars. To me, I think they're essential. So my suggestion to anyone starting a business who's in a business, 
put them into your package already. Like, it's just, this is what the package is. This is what it costs. Like there's no a la carte taking things out because what they're doing is they're eliminating you getting your full vision, you getting your full like profitability. And then also you're not going to be able to market the project. A lot of my projects can take up to a year to be built. So now I'm sitting there with no content. No, if you do the renderings, now you have content at least to promote it until it's built because from like concept to design to build to actual completion, I mean, I've had a project take a whole year and it was like four spaces. So it's good for designers so that they can market and get the content that they need. Um, so this is with, without, and then here's another view, which is like one of my favorite views. Uh, so we created this bud bar and I kind of took the concept from like the Apple store and like how you go to the Apple store and you have all the products on the table. Well, this is a bud bar. So it's really cool. You get iPads, you're able to like do research on like what, what you're looking for, what your vibe is, and then uh, things are on display. So it has that really cool communal uh, conjugation in the center of people just kind of like that energy that you feel when you're in an Apple store. That's what we want to bring into here. So we brought that concept, which was really fun. And then um, just furthermore, I want to just go into uh, fixture design. So when you're doing these high-end projects, everything needs to be custom. Like you can't do a high-end project and then bring in stuff that just is like running line product. Like people don't want that. They want something custom. They want the materials all to be intentional. And you can get inspiration from anywhere. Like I said, I pulled the coffee cup before. You guys can see the screen, right? It's like cut. It's like cutlery and like random gallery displays. Um, to me, I was like, this is cool. We can use this in, into marketing. And so it became this fixture and I, you know, designed the fixture, picked the materials and I was going for, you know, a cool greenhouse feel. And then, you know, picking a live slab and bringing like nature into the designs. So again, just this shows that you can get inspiration from anywhere really. Um, and then take that and translate it into whatever you're doing. I mean, these could be displays for purses. They can be displays for shoes. They can, uh, really display anything. It's all about getting that image and then creating something something custom that works. These are just custom display cases that they can put accessories in. They can showcase brands. We have illuminated LED panels here where you can change out brands and have showcasing for certain brands because there are a ton across the board. Again, more inspo, what that turns into, how it's translated, what materials are used. Uh, this is one of my favorite fixtures that I designed. Uh, I loved it because we started using vinyl. So vinyl is a really cool material to use because again, it changes in and out. So you can change the imagery um, and then it comes cohesive with, um, I'm just gonna go through these, this one. So this is a really cool fixture because it's like interchangeable. Have you guys like probably heard of like a peg wall display? So here they're able to like peg in these shelves and display different products. They can do long shelves, short shelves. They can do shelves with glass containers. So the biggest thing also with designing is make sure your piece is flexible. Like don't just build it to be static and what it is because over time you wanna allow the client to have the flexibility to change things out, to change the display um, to, you know, take that one idea and be able to transform it. Um, so that's a big thing. And then this is the bud bar, just showing the concept, the drawings, um, the reception. What's good about this package too is, you know, as a designer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back here, get back in this chat. As a designer, um, you're responsible to do the design pretty much, but you know, you don't really know what things cost until they go to bid, until they go to a mill worker. So, you know, I always talk about this and I'm, I'm pretty strong on it is value engineering. So you need to have a good, um, I'm, at two, I'm just checking my time. You need to have good vendors. Like Leslie had mentioned, having good vendors on board that, to help you out. So, you know, coming from corporate, I've gone to every design. I mean, I like lived in Vegas for like three months out of the year, like just going to a ton of design shows. There's the HD uh, hospitality show. It happens in Vegas. There's BDNY. I mean, I know with COVID, we, we don't get the luxury of really miss it because I get to connect with all my vendors, get to see everybody, get to hang out, do fun stuff. That's not happening anymore. But BDNY, check it out. They probably still have their website. They list a ton of vendors. Uh, there's NY, uh, NY Now. That one's a really cool show to go to too. A lot of artists, local artists, a lot of like Etsy designers too, like people making custom pillows, people just, I mean, Etsy's killing it right now. If anybody like lighting, the lead times are great because of COVID. Um, so check out Etsy, check like support local business people who are, you know, making really awesome things. Um, 
Also, there's Neocon that happens in Chicago every single year. That's a great show to go to as well. Again, a lot of this stuff is like commercial high-end hospitality, which is my market, my sector, but there are residential um, sectors within them. So I think that you guys could one, get a ton of inspiration to start to like, you know, expand your horizons on vendors, you know, starting to work with like Noel and Maharam and Loom and, uh, you know, Wolf Gordon, like a lot of those people, um, those vendors, you don't really get to come across unless you come from a commercial background. Uh, so looking into that is definitely uh, key. I don't know if we're on a questionnaire yet. What, what's my time looking like? Hold on. Um, um, you're so good. We have uh, till 320 if you want to share. Okay, great. So I have like five more minutes. I just want to open up, open up the screen. I don't know how to use this really well. I'm wow. I'm gathering the Q and A, so I'll uh, I'll feed them to you as we get that. Okay, yeah, let's do let's do the Q and A. I think I've kind of said enough. Um, you know, like I think the last thing is be a chameleon. Uh, also, like I'm all on board with just like creating a vibe and like not really being one thing or being something. You know, having to like keep a certain look or a certain aesthetic. I just say be you, be yourself, and like just be positive and 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 whatever, and you'll attract that in a sense. And you know, like have a good strong mindset because what you think you'll attract. So if you're like nervous or if you don't feel confident, the client you meet with is gonna feel that. They're gonna be like, all right, this girl doesn't really have a ton of confidence. We're gonna write a check to her right now. So, you know, make sure you're, you talk your talk and you talk about what, you, what you've what you worked on and, and be confident because that's essentially gonna set the tone. Um, your energy, your vibe and your mindset are like key. Um, Let's see what else. So Jessica, let me let me ask you this: um, Do you lead in the first meeting with um, offering up references of similar type clients and projects? What was that? I'm sorry. Do I? Do you, do you lead with um, offering up like references of similar type projects so that people can build some trust with you, knowing that you did such a great job for others? Do you give them an opportunity to talk to references? I mean, I put them out there sometimes. Uh, so like, for instance, I just landed like a really huge job. It's like a lobby amenities, a really, really cool job. And they, um, they had asked me like, you know, you look really young, the board's concerned about whether or not you have credibility. And so I'm like, okay, cool. I get it because I do look young, but um, I just send my resume and it kind of speaks for itself. And I send references, but at that point, once they've read everything, you know, they're like, okay, we get it. We get it now. So sometimes even sending my references and my resume, people are like, well, how did you do this? You know, they're still like suspicious, but um, I think my biggest thing is like, okay, if, if you list them and say, you can call so-and-so, you can call so-and-so, they feel more confident. I don't think they ever do like call though. Not that I'm aware of. They're like, all right, cool. Um, so, I mean, I'm pretty transparent. I have a LinkedIn, like go on my LinkedIn, you'll see who I worked with. You can go to my ex company that I worked for. You could see all the names I drop are real and I've like really done these projects. So um, I don't really lead off with like what I've done previously or, or like what I've worked on. Cause I think because they hired me, they already have done their research pretty much. They're like, all right, we've seen what you did or um, you know, we've done our research, we, we wanna hire you. So I don't really have to sell myself at the meeting. I'm already sold. I gotta just sell my, my price. That's it. <laughs> okay. Um, here's another one. Are the things that you showed on Spirit Leaf were any of those done mm -hmm. on foyer so no that was basically the those were photoshop renderings um and then they were done on a previous platform uh 3d max so again that was like the, the start of me doing branding like where it all came from and that was my first project that i got to create a brand and then create a design that was cohesive together not work with a brand that already had a language going and we were re designing it or giving it a, you know, a new fresh outlook. So that was the start of me putting something together and saying, Hey, you know what? Like I could, do, I mean, I could do this alone. Like I'm basically doing it all for another company. Why not do it for myself? So that was the start of me saying, you know what? I can take all these skills that I've learned and do it on my own platform for myself, for my own business, for me. So that's why I wanted to share that project. No, it wasn't a foyer rendering. Okay. Um, Building a brand can be, you know, quite daunting for a designer. So is there a process that you feel is straightforward and easy to follow to get started? Sure. I'm trying to find this, uh, the chat. Is this like, 
Um, I would say be yourself. Like I also left corporate because I felt like there were so many regulations on like what you could say, what you could post, what you could do. Like everything was just so like scheduled and just boring and as a creative, like really depressing. So I'll say if you're starting your own business and you're alone, just be yourself, do what makes you happy. You know, like just function the way that you need to function. Like if you need to work at seven o'clock at night till midnight or three in the morning, like do whatever works for you, but like be happy, live your life. And like that energy will be translated into your work. You, you know, like just be yourself and yourself is your brand. That's who I am. I've created a brand lifestyle for JLA and it's me. Like it's my energy, it's my vibe, but I take that energy and transform it into these different designs, these different brands, these different interpretations. Like, I don't think any project looks like the last. Um, I can become whoever I need to become for that specific client. Yep. Your, uh, the screen just got stuck. So if you could just restart the screen on the five keys to winning a design process. Oh yeah, sure. That way it'll just give you a background while we're going through Q and A. Yeah, no problem. So now I'm going to have you multitask. I'm going to ask you another question. Um, okay, great. Can you see it? You have... Yeah, we see it. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Do you, do you have a process going into a client? Meaning like when you're doing the needs analysis up front, do you have like a process you follow each time um, that's cookie cutter or is each of them like custom? They're all custom. I think it all just depends on the energy like that I get. I mean, I get really lucky and I get some really awesome clients like, but they're all different. So for me, my like process is like, let me learn who I'm working with. And then from there, like, I know this sounds crazy, but like you catch a vibe with them and you like understand what they like. You talk to them, you, you know, you could feel them out. And then you can also just feel out the space. I don't know if it's like an intuitive sixth sense for me, but like, I know, like, I feel like, all right, I know exactly what you guys need. And then I just execute really from there. So it, it's just like intuitive for me. I don't know. I just, once I meet them and I meet, and I see the space, I already like visually know what I want to do. And then I just execute and they trust the vision. You know, they, they rarely... The only time I get kickback is like on um, pricing and that's it. And sometimes, and, and then I value engineer that. That's what I was saying. Like knowing material is key. Like you can go from hardwood floors to engineered floors to vinyl floors. You know, like there's a process. There's even like three levels of vinyl flooring. There's like really high end with etching and maybe only six patterns. So they don't repeat itself all the time. And then there's this like flat vinyl that you glue down. There's the clip system. And then there's like the really crappy, like, 86 cents a square foot like vinyl so you know you, you you know the spectrum you can figure out where you need to be and then you know just value engineer you go from real wood to a, a wood veneer to a wood laminate you know you can take those scales down and now wood laminates I mean they look great they look pretty pretty nice so um just understanding that value engineering process you're able to still get the look and the aesthetic and not so much the price point of getting the higher end stuff although I like the higher end stuff that's my preference <laughs> we all do yeah <laughs> that's what we work so hard for here's yeah, another one sure. um from from the foyer team so pulling off you know the kind of high-end retail and commercial that you focus on is really mm -hmm. not like an easy task right that's somebody that's got the experience and the confidence to go after those type of deals <laughs> um do you have any tips on how you manage the multitasking that goes on within those accounts um listen it's stressful uh especially as a creative because sometimes i feel like if i'm not mentally there i can't produce a design so that's why i said like i hate deadlines because it's like it's your energy when you're creating and i know that might sound i mean as designers you'll know like just like looking up a chair what you want to do like that all takes your energy out and then sometimes stuff isn't vibing like a lot of the designs i've been doing like for the last four months I've designed them like three times. I'll wake up and look at it and be like, what the hell were you thinking? This is terrible. Delete it all, start over. So um, I think you have to like be in the right mind and like just be able to go with the flow. I've just realized that I just gotta like take it day by day. I can't stress out about it. I can't like, it's not life, design isn't life threatening. Like it's like, all right, if the only time I get a little nervous is like when it's a business and they need to open up. But even so, I like to do like my uh, project management because when I'm in construction, that's when I can make changes, make adjustments. You start to feel the space, you see it come together. So I always allow for creative freedom during construction phase. That's what I call it. I'm like, this is the concept, this is a design. And sometimes you can see my renderings and then see the project in real life and then go, okay, she's changed a few things. Like the idea and the concept's still there, but when it, when it like manifests into like what it's supposed to be, 
there's changes. So I like to just say, this is the concept, this is the design. Then we go into construction and I do cre creative freedom. Okay, perfect. Um, real quick, someone asked, could you show a FOIA rendering? Like, could you pull one up that, you, that you've that you done? Oh yeah, I'll show, um, sure. Let's pull up, let's just pull up um, Instagram. We've done a ton of foyer renderings. And then what I do is I take my foyer renderings and I bring them into like Photoshop sometimes. But now that you guys have that capability, it makes it a lot easier. So uh, this was the most recent one that we've done. <clears throat> Very simple. Can you see, you can see my screen, right? Uh, let's see. We could see your mouse. Yep, moving around. We're still okay, on the great. five keys to winning design. Oh, let's, oh, maybe I just have to change what screen is sharing. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Now we're good. There you go. <clears throat> Correct. So this is, this is a foyer rendering that we just, we just put out. Um, some of these renderings. So I had like so many projects going on board, like at once. So we tend to like kind of go back and forth on what renderings we're supplying. This was, a, this was a foyer rendering that we did in your program. Um, this is also a foyer rendering. So, I mean, they look great. They portray what we need them to portray. I did uh, some really cool ones. These are all foyer. <clears throat> this is a beach house in uh, Connecticut. So this was really cool. And then you could see like what it looked like before and then foyer rendering. This bat, this uh, kitchen rendering at the pool house. I think I did this in like 40 minutes on foyer like the night before it was due. <laughs> so it's pretty awesome to be like, wow, I can do this really quick. Cause when I'm working with like farming out my renderings, these guys are like in Mexico, they're in China. So there's like a huge, I mean, you could see this is like, this is like a high paid rendering that I've purchased from one of my, one of my uh, companies that I work with. You could see the quality is like pretty much there, but this takes like a week to get together. I'm like marking it up and like making sure they're doing sh stuff the right way, as opposed to like, this is for you right here. And it's like instant. I could see it. I could preview it. Like I don't got to go through language barriers or time zone changes. Um, so it's a lot more efficient for me. This was, this was my first foyer rendering I did. This is where I was like introduced to you guys the first time. What was that? May, May 12th. Um, I like downloaded the program and I did this rendering and it was pretty, pretty quick. And I was like, wow, this program is pretty awesome. Um, so that was my first, my first foyer rendering um, was this, this baby. Uh, and so just to talk about Fourier, you know, coming from, I, I went to the New York School of Interior Design in Manhattan. We're number one in the nation uh, for interior design and architecture. So we are interior architects um, and designers. We're, we're not decorators. Uh, so we, we take that, that term very offensive. Uh, what I will say is that we had to learn every program. So we learned Revit. We know we learned, we had the struggle because, I mean, I've been in this business for 10, 10 plus years now what the industry was. I mean, like, I really think we should work together and try to get this put into the accredited, you know, program for interior design, because when you, when I went to school, I mean, I made all my money, like building models for people because nobody knew how to use the programs. I just picked it up very easily. So I was able to build them custom things that they needed for their projects. But, you know, there was Revit and Revit is like very boxy. It's very like commercial you know, it doesn't have a lot of like flair or really cool models. And then there's SketchUp. SketchUp is really cool because it has this SketchUp library, typically like kind of similar to what Foyer has, like this library of like cool furniture and like styling. So I used to go into AutoCAD, build a plan, bring it into Revit, build the exterior, the building, any kind of stairs that I had, any kind of like architectural walls. Then I would export it from Revit and go into SketchUp, then bring in all the furniture, all the lighting, render it. This was my process back in college. I used every program for its strengths. Then, then I would render it. Uh, and then after that, bring it into Photoshop and start to add things that I couldn't add. So it, it went through this entire elongated process. And at the end of the day, I mean, it looked okay, but it still looked like a rendering. These days, these renderings look like photographs. Like some people are like, wait, is that real or is that a rendering? So I'm like, it's a rendering. <laughs> but now they just look so <laughs> realistic. So, you know, it's good for, for marketing. And there's not that many. I do a foyer rendering and it goes right into Photoshop and then it goes on to the client and into the page. So there's only two steps. Back in the day, we had a struggle. So it has like so seven steps. Um, so yeah, I think foyer is awesome for people who don't 
understand computer programs. For, first of all, they're so expensive too. You guys are so affordable. You're accessible and you're just like user-friendly. I mean, amazing thing you guys are doing. I wish I had you in college, it's been a lot easier. <laughs> we hear we hear that quite a bit. And we, we're actually in several design colleges now as an accredited um, software tool sitting. Oh, are you? That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. So we're making strides there for sure. Yeah. Um, we have one more um, question here and I just want to um, bring this up because this one actually is really good. So I totally understand as I'm, I'm the same to you as being open to design styles. However, would you represent that on your social platforms mm -hmm. with people that really don't know you? Is that confusing for them, do you think? Um, as I have different designs based on my past clients, I'd love to post them, but I don't want to confuse my audience. What are your thoughts to sharing multiple styles on social? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not, I look, so I don't plan my social media feed. I just like post and people are like, oh, your feed looks so good. And I'm like, I don't even plan it. Like I just post it. So I would say just like, do you, you might, you might post something and like bring in a new client. Like, I don't think showing versatility as a designer is ever going to push people away. Like if you do, you're just pushing the, like you're pushing the right people away because you don't need people that have tunnel vision. You don't need people who are closed-minded. You need open-minded people to say, listen, I do many things. And that's going to give you the opportunity to enter those sectors. So if you don't show that work, unless you can talk about it, like you're not going to ever get that work. So I would say show everything. Cause someone might like, for instance, I had a client, this client right here, this is Griggs. Um, she had seen a job I posted at um, when I did Trump Plaza. And again, like I say that and some people are like, oh, and then some people are like, wow, great. We need that level of like luxury in our project. So that can be a hit or it can be a miss. Either way, it doesn't matter to me. It's all about look at the work and look what was done. So she had seen that job and said, oh, I love the fireplace. You did the book match. And then, you know, that's how it, that's how I was hired. So for some people, they'll look at the details for some others they're looking at the aesthetic so it doesn't really matter what the project is or who who the project's for that like some people are like oh i really just like um like there was one client that i had posted this i posted this and they were like oh i love the black and white i love that you did black trim i want to work with you like just off a of black trim like so some people will just really attract the most like meniscal thing of like, oh, she used the color green. I really love green. I want to work with this girl. <laughs> so don't ever be afraid. I say put out all your work as long as, as long as it's like your work, put it out always. I wouldn't say look a certain way because who the hell cares, right? Just be you. Yep. Love it. All right. Just, perfect. Bye. We appreciate it, Jessica. Appreciate you joining us today as well. Awesome. Thank you for having me. And um I, I have some questions here. How do I answer these? Are these going to stay up here? I think they were sent to me personally. I'm not sure. I think Maybe. we went through all of them. I think there might be two that we we didn't really get to there. Okay, um, great. We we have we have access to the video, um, so RT and and Zoe are keeping track of a lot of this too. So we'll make sure we do all follow ups. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Coming in. All right. <laughs> Take care, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just a few things to wrap up. So a uh, couple ways to win prizes. If, if you're following us on uh, Instagram, you'll see that we're already awarding multiple hundred dollar cash uh, transfers each week to different folks that are getting top buzz creator on social media. So again, um, just share about the event, use the hashtag, um, hashtag for your talks, Neo and uh, submit your, um, you know, your uh, buzz uh, on social there just by tagging us. Um, you're already registered if you're already in this webinar series. So it's not too late. You can still participate in session four. Uh, we're still giving four lucky winners a chance to win $50 and then a quarterly subscription to NEO. And then um, our last one is kudos on your first render. So this is where you sign up on foyer.com. You sign up for a 14 day free trial if you're not already a customer. Um, you do not require a credit card and you could create your first render, share it on Instagram or Pinterest, use the hashtag for your Neo weekly. And again, one lucky winner will get the $250, um, you know, last prize that we have. So that is where we're at. Um, we are out of time. So we appreciate everybody coming here. Great audience today. A lot of um, good chats, a lot of great questions. Uh, thank you all. And we'll see you next week for session four. Bye-bye.